All right, so I'll give you a question, okay? As a human being that wants to have a relationship with God, how do I use the Tanakh to inspire my prayer life? And I'll tell you why that's an interesting question. A, a Jewish person can open their Siddur three times a day and find wonderful prayers that I can't use. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult and frustrating and prayer is something I've been thinking about a lot. And if, so a person, they go to a, they go to a shul and it's not uncommon for them to get turned away. And sometimes it's not a test. It's not someone to do the three turn away tradition. And I can't just turn up because of the security issues here. Even with my passport and a proof of where I live, they won't let me in. So, <laughs> as a human being who loves Judaism, how do I use Judaism in my life? Because sometimes just n not eating the limb of a living animal isn't enough to have. You know, you, you want more. You, you know, uh, the Talmud says, King Solomon speaks about when he built the temple that God should hear not only the prayers of national Israel, but every man. He says that specifically when the temple was, was built in his inauguration speech. The Talmud says something very interesting. The Talmud says that God listens to the prayers of non-Jews and responds to them more uh, quickly than he does to a Jew. And the Talmud explains why. It's because non-Jews, you now we put on non-Jews, totally on uh, B'nai Nuach, meaning those who worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But um, non-Jews, if, if they pray to the God of Israel, and he doesn't answer their prayer, so if it's a Jewish person, so a Jewish person will say, oh, no, I, it's not the best thing for me, I realize I've studied different texts, passages in Scripture where I realize that sometimes the things I want are not best, or I did deserve it, or there's a bigger picture. But a non-Jew may not, because they're not as connected. If a Ben Noach is not as connected to Scripture, they may reject the God of Israel altogether. And Hashem doesn't want them to do this. It means that they're in much greater danger. If, some, if something spiritual does not operate well in their lives. For example, as it turns out in Jewish law, it's a greater sin to steal from a, a, a Gentile than from a Jew. It's a greater sin for a Jew to steal, for a Jew to steal from a non-Jew than from a Jew, because if a Jew steals from another Jew, so the, well, the Jew will go, wow, you stole from me, you're a bad person. But the non-Jew, it'll be a chil Hashem, which means it'll desecrate the name of God, because that person might be inclined to just blame Judaism, blame the God of Israel, and say, and curse the God of Israel, which is a violation of seven Noachide laws. I remember when I was um, speaking in, in Houston, and uh, it was around the time I, I did a debate there, probably about a year and a half, two years ago. Craig Evans. And yeah, 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 Dr. Evans. Wonderful, well, wonderful uh, fellow, enjoyed the debate. And we did a series of programs in Houston um, at Native, hmm. which is a an outreach center for B'nai Noach in the greater Houston area. And, and someone asked the question about the seven Noachide laws. And a point that should be said, uh, a couple points should be said, is they're not individual laws. They actually amount to some 70 commandments that fall into roughly, to exactly seven categories. There, there are 69 commandments if you break it all down. But the person, you know, said that he didn't find it that satisfying that, you know, I have a commandment not to eat from a living animal, I have a commandment to be honest, to not to steal. I, I don't go around stealing. Like, what? And I explained, what I thought was very valuable, that in a way it's, it's easier to be a Jew than to be a Ben Noach, in that a Ben Noach could attribute 
keeping the Noahide laws, and some people may go, where do these laws come from? They're all over the book of Genesis. They're called, they're called the Noahide laws because why aren't they called the laws of Adam, Adam and Eve? Because as it turns out, the first couple, so their children, boys and girls, sisters and brothers, we saw, you see in Genesis chapter 5, married each other because God wanted to start the world with one couple. So they actually did not keep the Noahide laws, the children of Adam, because one of the prohibitions is that uh, one cannot, uh, incest is forbidden, but because God wanted the whole world to begin with one couple, why is not germane to this program? So therefore, it's a Noahide laws. And uh, so I explained that, you know, when a Jew puts on film or, or uh, makes Kiddush on Shabbat, so there's no other way for me, when I celebrate Shabbat, to interpret that experience except to attribute it to the God of Israel. When I, uh, when I observe the festivals, what, how else can I understand walking into a tabernacle, into a booth on Sukkot? I can only understand it spiritually. But a person who is a Ben Noach, a righteous Gentile, could get in trouble. Why? Because it's not enough to simply observe the seven Noahide laws. One must observe them because the God of Israel commanded you. I'll never forget this. There was a person who I'm sure you know. His name was Christopher Hitchens. He died last year. He was a staunch atheist. And he wrote a book, I think, God is Not Great is the name of the book. And he devoted the last years of his adult life, based on philosophical reasoning, attacking religious belief. I'm sure you've heard of him. As it turned out, he discovered toward the end of his life that he actually was Jewish. But he didn't know it. Uh, in his debates, and he was an eloquent speaker, he would argue with theists, almost always Christians, but he, he had an argument he would use that I thought was, in a way, I found very intriguing and shed a lot of light on this conversation. He asked the question, could you think of something that a something wicked that a religious person can do that, a, that an atheist could not do. But because of their religion, a religious person can do. And he would say to the audience, of course you could think of something immediately that people do in the name of religion, that if someone doesn't believe in God, it wouldn't occur to them to do that. And then he, would, he said, he would ask the question, the corollary question, and that is, and this is the punchline, is there something good that a, a, a religious person can do, a theist can do, that an atheist cannot do? And this would get everyone stumbling all over the place. Is there something that a religious person can do? Is there any action a religious person can do that an atheist cannot do? And he would challenge really sometimes very bright opponents to come up with, with the response. And I, to me, the answer was so obvious. And people who were very bright really were struggling with this question. What he was missing is that uh, people who are not Jewish are created in the image of God. Why is it that people, whether they are believers or not believers, um, have an inclination to, to not steal, are repulsed by murder, by killing somebody. Why does it bother us? It doesn't bother cats who commit incest and murder every day, and dogs rape every day. The animals you love, your pets, every day commit the most acts that humans would do. It would be unbelievable. So why does it bother 
the human being? The answer is because we are created in the image of God. Christopher Hitchens and every atheist is created in the image of God, has a Ruach Elohim inside. The question is, will he recognize that it's from God or not? Christopher Hitchens denied that any of his that any of his judgment and his behavior had anything to do with God. The true answer is that people, whether they are faithful or not faithful, are 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 find the seven Noachai laws deeply gripping because they're creating the image of God. And the key for a Ben Noach is to recognize that. And when a, when a Ben Noach acts morally, whether they're faithful to the person who they're married to, whether they act honestly in business, paying their employees on time. But rather than just say, I'm doing it because it makes sense to me, but I do it because the God of Israel desires it, this is a very holy thing. And it's, the, the, it's a, a very great challenge. There is one other point, and that is that we see from Scripture that it's vital for those who are righteous Gentiles to cleave to the Jewish people. We see it in the second chapter of Isaiah, where it says that the nations will stream to, to, to the great mountain of the Lord, to Jerusalem. They will go in the light of, of, of Israel, that they will connect, they will stream to this highest mountain, which is in the opposite direction that water ordinarily, uh, ordinarily moves. So I will say to you that if a person is not studying scripture carefully with the Jewish people and is not studying the book of Psalms very carefully, they're very likely to get into a lot of trouble. They might be creating God in their own image. I can tell you this, I would be completely lost if I wasn't studying scripture every single day. The book of Psalms is very unique and, it, and people who are not Jewish are particularly find it particularly meaningful. How is the book of Psalms very, very unique, for, especially for Ben Noah? Because unlike for the Jewish people, where many of our most formidable experiences as a people occurred with a miraculous experience, which we observed, as a nation, in fact, every Jewish holiday is founded on a on a national miraculous experience, which the entire nation experienced. Rather than we don't have any miracles associated with the miracles that Elijah or Elisha did with individuals. The Book of Psalms, King David sees God in in nature, in each and every in life in the life each and every day. And that's what's so extraordinary about this work. And it lifts us up. But I will say that if a non if a person who's not Jewish isolates himself or herself from the Jewish community, they're in a lot of trouble. Can um, I open up a, a, a dialogue here and ask some more difficult yeah. questions? Uh, okay, so we have a situation where, as you mentioned, in First Kings 8, Solomon makes this wonderful prayer, really, in, in this dedication, and um, and asks the Creator to hear the prayer of the non-Jew who is praying toward the Creator when he's pointing toward the temple, even in his mind. I think it's says Jewish scripture. Mm -hmm. So you don't know where the temple is, but in your mind, you're focused on the temple, and you make the prayer. In, instantly, I'm asking myself, what? format would that prayer take? And a bigger question for me is, if the Jewish people are told in the text to not do things that the Gentiles do in relation to how the, na the, how the nations express their relationship with the deity, you know, don't do on, as the Gentiles do, and right. as I am a Gentile of the nations, and I can't... The Gentiles not... But I can't, I can't pray as a Jew prays. So if uh, I have to pray as can, a... You must. In fact, not only can you, you must. And I want to just explain one thing, okay? I need to say this. 
is so critical. I want to tell you a little bit about Jewish prayer. You understand why it's vital that every child of God, everyone who uh, is created in the image of God, must pray like a Jew. It's impossible not to. I don't know if you've ever been to a courtroom, but uh, normally the way a court works is everyone files into the court, all the interlocutors, whether it's civil or criminal, whatever it is, the courtroom was filled, and then the, uh, there's a, someone who announces, everyone please rise because for the judge. And everyone stands up and the judge walks in. He sits down, then everyone else sits down. Why? It, this happened, I think, in every country in the world. Why do they do that? Well, I mean, this is quite a spectacle. Couldn't the judge have walked in beforehand, been sitting there, everyone walks in? Because there, it's very important, it, when, even when sitting for a judge who is human, a, a, a judge who is bus of a dumb, who is flesh and blood, it's critical that when someone, when everyone in the courtroom stands up when the judge walks in, that means, what are you really saying? You're saying, I recognize that you're the judge. I recognize that you have this authority. That's what it's about. It's not a some just formality, it's some sort of thing. It really is a very important statement. You know that when a Jew prays, let's say, uh, chakras or morning prayer. So, do you know that for the first two thirds, we don't ask God for anything? We don't ask God for a thing. What we do is we think about God, we learn about who He is, that He is our Father, He is our King, He is our Judge, He is filled with mercy. We express a deep gratitude to Him before we dare even ask God of anything. And then we finally, when we come to actually ask God of anything, we, we express the words of King David in Psalm 51, Hashem sevasai tiftoch ufi agiti lasecha, the Lord, may the Lord open our, my lips so that my, my mouth may declare your praise. And then we go, blessed the Lord, King of the universe, um, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Before we even dare, and you know what we do? You know what the first thing we ask for? We ask for anything? You know what the first thing we ask for? The very first thing, and I would say if a morning prayer, so you'll know what goes on in the synagogue on a, any, any morning during the week. After we've recognized who the God of Israel is, and we recognize that he's one, no other, and we finally come to the first, what's called a bakosha, which means asking of something, you know, we ask for, we ask for wisdom. You're the one who gives wisdom. We plead to God, because without wisdom, how could you even talk to God? So if this is true for a Jew, is it certainly not, is it not true for a Ben Noach? It's true for every one of us. We're all creating the image of Hashem. So therefore, it's very important for the, for the nations of the world to connect to the Jewish people, to find out how we pray, to get an art school prayer book, to study with the rabbi. And today, I mean, look, I'll tell you the truth. 30 years ago, there was no internet. I don't know when it was, but there was, we didn't have internet, so people didn't have computer. Today, everyone has access to this. But yeah, if you don't know how, how to pray and how to speak to God and what does prayer mean, and why does God listen to prayer, and who is God who you pray to? You're going to get in a lot of trouble. You're going to get in exactly the amount of trouble that a Jew would get into. The only difference between a Jew and a non-Jew is that a Jew has a role of being a light to the nations of the world. That is our role. How do I know, how do I know that? Because my Bible says so. It says so in Isaiah 49. It says so in Isaiah 43. It says so in, in Exodus 19. That's the role of a Jew. There, we, there is no other distinction. Our role is to be a light to the non-Jew. So if, if, you, if someone is praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and believes in the prophets of Israel, why would you turn your back? I say this with all the love in my heart, but I want to be straight with you. Why would you turn your back, in a sense, on the instructions that the, that Isaiah has given you, if you're a, a right a Benoah, and Isaiah is saying, listen to the Jews. It doesn't mean, you know, the Jews, you know, uh, Noam Shamsky, 
you know, don't mean that. Meaning, if you're not listening to those who are teachers of Torah, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And Zechariah is telling us that in the Messianic age, what will the world look like in a perfect state? That ten Gentiles will will uh, will embrace the shirt of a Jew and say, take us with you, because now we know that God is with you. And says the hem of a Jew, literally says it. So if, and the the messianic age is not like that's a different time when there's a different moral standard messianic age if we have a messianic prophecy everywhere isaiah 2 where the nations come to the jew and says to the to the children of jacob come we're going to go with you to the mountain of the lord what does that mean that means that's what the world should look like that's the ideal therefore it's very critical for people who are uh the name uh, Noach, to study with the children of Israel, to learn from the children of Israel, to learn how we pray. Uh, because if we just got out of bed and say, hey, God, I want this and that, what, what, who am I talking to? I'm staying for the King of Kings, Lord of Wars, host of hosts. Fabulous. I, um, I think really it's the format of prayer that troubles a lot of people. It troubles me, but that's that's a much bigger um, question, uh, how how yeah, how do I? How should I pray? Um, would it be fair to say that Hannah's prayer would be a good? Because um, you know, some people there's a worry that you either copying the the Jewish nation to a point where you're um, appearing as a Jew, and then there's also the worry that you're not doing enough and that it's almost too freestyle. But then when I see Hannah go in to pray in the text, she just literally pulls the heart out. I want to tell you what she does. You're very delicious, Jason. I miss you very much. I'll tell you that. So Hannah, in, in Hannah's, it's very, very beautiful. So, as you know, Hannah uh, was childless. No one really quite understood her. Her husband didn't understand her. She wanted a child. He says, you've got me. It's more than 10 cents. And she says, She's going, what is, you can't replace my desire for a child. Ailey, the high priest, didn't understand. So ultimately, she turns to God who understands every soul. And her prayer is really very beautiful. I'm gonna, but she says, that, I want to um, turn your attention to what Hannah does in verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2 of 1 Samuel. And she does exactly exactly what I just shared with you, how would you praise? Let's break down, let's break down. I don't know if you have a Bible in front of you, but if you have uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. If you, you just wait yeah. a second, I can pull it up. Sure, um, uh, it's in three segments. Now notice, no, I want you to know, keep, as you read it, notice how Hannah goes from first recognizing God in the third person and then and then she moves to the intimate but first she recognizes who I shall is and then so watch the third person this is in one sentence she moves from the third person right to the second person and then she comes to this conclusion there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. It's very, very, it's so beautiful. I, I, I hope that I'll merit to, um, to um, witness the messianic age and, 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 and meet her in the resurrection of the dead. So she says, her first word, the first phrase, the three segments, yeah. this is how you talk to Hashem. And this is everything. This is, that passage is how one is to pray to God. That passage. She starts off by saying, Ein Kadosh Kashem. There is no one holy like God. You notice, now that's reverent. It's third person. It's, he's the king. Okay, that's number one. And when she says that there's no one besides the God of Israel, she then turns to him 
And she says, Ki ein Bildecha. She says, no one like you. You see that? It's so that's what I meant. That's this is it. There's no one like you. So she goes, first, you are the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. That's who I'm standing before. That's third person. And once she has completely grasped the fullness of God's mercy and glory, she then, with this intimacy, isn't it? Ki ein biltecho. There is no one besides you. I have no other love but you. I serve no one but you. I bow before no one but you. I praise no one but you. And therefore, once so now we did stage A, Hashem. Stage two is giving Hashem a kiss. You're my only beloved. Then she ends her prayer. The ain sur kelukena. There is no rock like our God. Isn't that? That's it. That's it. I wish I can go back, you know, um, 3,000 years and give her a kiss. Well, I we nearly did, kiss. right? We, we were there um, on the site in Shiloh. Yeah. That, that, that blows yeah. my mind. That That's we, where we were, right? Uh, That's where the tabernacle, we stood there. We stood there with the tabernacle was erect for 369 years. What a holy woman this is. Now, so therefore, when I say to my sweet brother, um, study with the Jew, we're not like making it. This is how the prophets and prophetesses, how they spoke to the God of Israel. And she produced one of the giant prophets who would anoint King David. She produced Samuel, who's the great prophet of his age, who, who poured out the Torah to us, who was the guide of, of a fabulous generation that ushered in the golden era of the Davidic dynasty. But that was it. So first, you're standing for the Lord, third person. Just, all we did was take one passage and just kiss every sweet little word. That's it. It's a passage of nine words, Three, three, and three. That's it. That's how we pray. So first, recognize before whom you are standing, before whom you worship. Who is he? Number one. And then turn and kiss. And you know, when, uh, you know, if you have a, if a, a woman who's short, has a husband who's very tall, and she loves him very, very much, so she stands on her tippy toes to give him a kiss, and he bends down a little bit to give her a kiss. So just get on your toes for a good kiss. And then and then she ends with the words, the Ain Sur Kilokino, we have no rock like our Lord. That's it. So I, that's what I do. Learn from the children of Israel. If you're not immersed in scripture, you lost. Of course you are, because the whole Bible is to tell you, guide you how to live your life. You do need the Jewish people. Of course you can't just you know, someone's going to, I mean, let me just type, you're going to read Isaiah and you, you're you not really immersed in it. You're going you're gonna to find yourself very bewildered by it. So study with the children of Israel. I mean, God-fearing religious teachers. You know who I'm talking about. This is not rocket science. And pour yourself over Scripture. But if you're not immersed in Scripture, I'd be lost. I'd be gone. If I... If I wasn't studying, I mean, today I was just studying, pouring over Isaiah almost all day. If I went a day and I didn't touch a scripture, I'd be gone. I'd be spiritually, I'd be, I will have taken, it'll take me time to recover from that experience. So immerse yourself. One other thing, try to go to a synagogue. If, now, if you live in America or Canada, usually you can just walk into a synagogue. In Europe and in Asia, it can be more difficult because from what I'm told, there's more of a, people, are, the Jewish community is more, is much more security minded. And if you're not known to the rabbi, they may, they may not, 
let you in the synagogue, only because there's so much terror all over Europe and there's such great threats of terror that there's enormous security. What you can do is if you live, like you live in Ireland, Jason, as an example, and there's a synagogue you'd like to go to, the rabbi may not know who you are. So there's a special threat with ISIS and all this crazy stuff going on now, and the Europeans are, I don't have to go into what's going on in Europe. Europe is, is a disaster right now. Have asked a rabbi that you know in America or Canada that you have a connection to to write a letter on your behalf to the rabbi. And that rabbi will very likely pay careful attention to that. Because rabbis are a little nervous whether we're in Indonesia, or whether in Ireland, in England. Anti-Semitism is now, I was going to use the word exploding, and then I realized that was not, a, that was a, maybe a poor choice of words, maybe it's an excellent choice of words, mm. I have no idea what to say. Look what happened in Mumbai in India, to the Chabad house, where they went and killed everyone, and so on. So the people are a little concerned, they're a little nervous, a little worried. It's a major security issue today. I mean, in truth, how much time does European Jewry have left I don't know, meaning before they have to leave. The clock is ticking. There's a, there's a, everyone in Europe is telling me they're watching the clock. So I would say to you, if you, you should really try to connect to the Jewish community. If you can go into the synagogue, don't ask, can I go? Don't ask. If, if, there's a Yiddish saying, as my freak, this is saying treif. If you ask, it's really not kosher. It's better. If you could go without asking, that's the best thing. Just go to a class. Don't ask, can I go? I'm... And then some people go, I used to be a messianic. Don't do any of that stuff. Just go. I'd like to attend. And if there is, if you live in a country where there is a very deep security concern, obviously people are worried. You know, obviously, you know, this is... The, despite what we're told by the left every day, they want to kill Jews. So people are nervous who's going to walk in. So you know a rabbi on Facebook, you know another rabbi. So have that rabbi write to the rabbi on your behalf, just because they are a little nervous, and they are. And I, I mean, in Indonesia, thank God, I've never experienced anti-Semitism ever in this country. Please God, that will continue. It's the only country I've never experienced it in. But, um, but in, in Europe, people are a little worried. In Asia, people are a little worried. If that's the case, I have someone write a letter on your behalf. But you have to connect to the Jewish people. You have to immerse this I mean, could you imagine a, a Ben Noach is, is able to connect to the God of Israel without Scripture, but a Jew needs Scripture? Mm. Are you insane? <laughs> what are you talking about? And why would God be saying, or everywhere through his prophets of blessed memory, that when Mashiach comes in the Messianic age, every it's all over the place, the, the non-Jews will be coming to the Jews to learn Torah from. Well, what, if, 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 not, if non-Jews are not supposed to be doing that, then it would be sinful to do that in the Messianic age as well. It's obviously all Messianic prophecy is what the world looks like in an ideal state. In an ideal state, the Jew takes his role up as a priestly nation, as being the rabbis of the world, as being a light of the world, not the writers of the New York Times to the world, that's garbage. You're not the Bernie Madoffs, whatever, all the Norman Finkelsteins. No, I don't mean them. The role of the Jew is to be to shine God's light to the rest of the world. So if that's what God is that's what's going to happen in the messianic age. You think that's a sin now? That's what God wants now. And I say this to you. If you go through a little challenge, a little difficulty of getting into a synagogue, or Hari Zemeshubach, I envy any Ben Noah who works a little bit harder than it would be for me to get into a synagogue. I want to talk to you out there who are in Europe as an example. How great is Hashem will see such love and sacrifice you have to work so hard to, to be able to attend the synagogue and to learn, to learn how Jews pray. And this is, you know, and this hat max, this, is, this show is not orchestrated. I told you exactly how we pray in a synagogue during the week. On Shabbos, we don't ask for God for things. We don't ask for bakasha. 
I mean, we don't ask for things Shabbos a, a day of joys and praise Hashem. But during the week, we re recognize who Hashem is. Before we even think about asking for anything, the first thing is we, we stand up for the, for the great King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And then, once we're ready, we then, Ki Ein Botecha, because there is no one like you. And Ein Sur Kelokeinu. There is no rock like our God. That was fabulous. That was really good. And um, I appreciate you, because we didn't talk about this beforehand. So I really like, I um, threw you in at the deep end on that. And it's and again, uh, it's kind of a difficult subject too, um, because you're speaking to a nation who are parts of many nations. And uh, so I appreciate you um, taking the time and effort to, to break that down a little bit. And I hope it helped many of the people out there. It's something that I've been looking at a lot more lately, um, trying to find my place and um, the do's and don'ts. So I appreciate it very much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Singer. Um, Always. Oh, um, so, uh, and I feel uh, that I have to uh, mention your fabulous books, the Let's Get Biblical. Um, there must be a word for two books together. Yeah. Buy something, but anyway, there are the two fantastic encyclopedias of knowledge, and uh, you can go over to uh, outreachjudaism.org and uh, Toby Singer TV, right? And there's a link there to get those books, they're fabulous. Uh, I use them all the time. In fact, um, my I, half of my Facebook posts are plagiarizing the content of those books, so um, everyone should go and get those. Um, so thank you very much, Toby, for your time again, oh, it was really lovely. And uh, if you got, <laughs> if you guys have questions um, that you'd like to um, put to the rabbi, please leave them in a comment under this post, um, and we hopefully will get to them all in time. Bye bye.